Surgery consumes a big slice of the healthcare dollar and often makes the difference between life and death. Yet it's been largely untouched by value-based care. Today's guest, Care Syntax co-founder and CEO Dennis Kogan, believes the time is ripe to develop accountable care organizations for surgical procedures and interventions. Is he right? Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. Dennis Kogan, CEO of Care Syntax, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you, David. I want to hear about what you're doing now, but before that, I want to hear about how you got to where you are and would love to hear about uh, you know, what your childhood was like, uh, any influences from your childhood that have stuck with you in your career. Plenty, plenty. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been born into a family of surgeons, uh, three generations, I think going back to 19th century. Uh, I was one of the exceptions uh, to our lineal preference and actually went uh, into the technical realm. So I spent my formative years at Carnegie Mellon University getting an information systems degree and then ended up getting an MBA at Harvard Business School. But uh, it's in those early days, you know, as I was training to be an engineer, uh, having physicians and being at CMU, having a lot of exposure to robotics and security uh, innovation that I started sort of thinking through a little bit, some of the applications of technology to healthcare. And of course, my, my dad was a helpful thought partner. Um, and I think, you know, from then on, it kind of continued being on my mind as I was uh, pursuing a career in consulting. I worked as a data scientist in a very specialized consulting company, helping healthcare businesses launch products and sort of price them. Um, I, I got to know the industry of healthcare from a business perspective. Um, so that, you know, sort of introduced a little bit of the demand and the pain points and how technology could further fit in. And then at HBS, I met my co-founder who's equally passionate about healthcare, uh, and surgery as well. And, uh, eventually we started this business together. Uh, so as you can see, it was in a way, uh, not surprising, right? Having this background yeah. with, with family and, and tech upbringing, converging, that seems very logical. And I'm happy I did that. Now, did your, uh, did you get a hard time from your family when you're studying engineering, you know, in, in college, they worried that wasn't a pre-med that you'd fallen off the, the track or what was the feeling? You know, it wasn't, I mean, so I, I have a, I'm a third culture kid. So my, uh, I'm a, you know, I was born into the former Soviet Union. So we immigrated. So, you know, the, the background of my family and surgeons in the former Soviet Union were not exactly the same, not the same occupation. It was tough no. for them. And so they, they, as I was growing up, I think, you know, they, they, they didn't ever push me in that direction, you know? Uh, and so I think there was a lot of appreciation for the clinical side and patient care, but it's, it was a tough job to be a surgeon then for them. So I think they appreciated that I, I'm leaning into technology. You know, this was, uh, I was born in 1984. So this was in, you know, in the nineties where I first got my exposure in school to like dial up and I, I leaned into that and they loved yeah. me doing that. And I think they just let me forge my own path. Sounds good. What did you think about HBS? I'm, I'm an alum from uh, earlier on. It was difficult. It was thought provoking having engineering background and data science background, as you remember, you know, I think having, you know, the, you know, ha having that forum daily to, to discuss complex matters, you know, it was an interesting exposure, but I learned a lot. Uh, and of course got exposure to some amazing professors and people, and it certainly helped, helped me succeed entrepreneurially as well. Yeah. My, uh, my roommate first year was, uh, a MIT, uh, chemical engineer. And uh, he'd worked at DuPont and very smart guy. Um, and we had our first class, uh, first take home test in uh, tech ops, technology and operations management. And I remember I, I had come out of consulting and I saw the, the whole thing was about whether you needed to, uh, whether they needed to replace this piece of capital equipment in the factory. And I saw uh, the first page, it said, you know, the, the VP of engineering, or whatever said it was a no brainer. Anyway, so I knew, okay, well, that's a red herring. And for sure the answer is no. So I already knew the answer. 
anyway, so I went through it. Boom, boom, boom. I nailed it. Anyway, so he spent like all night on it. And then he's his came to the conclusion that uh, there's not enough information here in order to give the answer. And I think it's because, you know, he is coming from a chemical factory where like, if you don't have enough information, like you don't make that because it could explode. But whereas consulting is more like, yeah, I can see where this is going. Uh, so it was actually very interesting even for me to see that. Yeah, for sure. And my interesting that you mentioned that class, my professor was Francis Fry, who uh, later on went on to Uber, if you remember, to be their first chief culture officer. So, you know, we had a lot of interesting discussions and operations around, you know, culture and building, building things, which was very helpful for me, you know, as I was building my own team also in Care Syntax. So all in all, it was a fantastic experience. Very, very important. Good. All right. So for Care Syntax itself, so it sounds like obviously you, you, you were kind of like born ready to start on, you know, something in this, in this area, you met your co-founder in B-School, but what were the origins of the company? How did you know you wanted to found a company? Uh, how did it come about? Well, we knew enough about surgery from personal background and, and kind of the research uh, through education that this is a huge um, area. Um, and there is a lot of importance to surgery, you know, based on the number of patients that undergo surgery, but also in terms of the business aspects, right? So Europe or US, uh, you know, most hospitals depend on surgery as a key driver of profitability and real budget fulfillment, right? And at the same time, there's still a ton of variability, right? So if you go back to what we learned in Tom, right, and think about Toyota continuous improvement and variability in, pr in production theory, right, you know, for various reasons, surgery hasn't undergone a lot of the change and technological enablement that makes industrial settings so safe and effective. It was very obvious. So when you combine that, you know, lag and adoption of key technologies, and then the size of the opportunity, and still problems that, um, you know, many outcomes face, it was a very fundamental um, realization that there is a big unserved need. Um, you know, and then, of course, the personal connection and my partner's uh, family also has links to acute care and my, my parents being uh, surgeons. I think that that helps. So I think combination of those two made it very natural. Of course, the journey has been full with, of its own twists and turns. But, you know, you know, it was one of those entrepreneurial founding stories where you, you marry your own passion for things with a real problem. And so how did you, you like first get some of a foothold? Because obviously these, these tools and techniques, technologies are useful elsewhere, but healthcare is it's sort of its own beast. Surgeons get to do, have gotten to do sort of whatever they want. Uh, and it hasn't really been a fit. So how, how did you get a, get a foothold uh, and get customers? Yeah. I mean, our, our foothold, um, was actually inside the operating room itself. So, I mean, we always had this long uh, reaching business plan of becoming a broader platform for improving outcomes in surgery through technology and data. But the starting point was very pragmatic. You know, we thought about, you know, the real problems that surgeons had at that time. And that was still, um, you know, having lack of you know, automation and lack of ability to quickly access information and access um, you know, certain digital features real time in their workflow. Um, so we entered, uh, you know, the market by being kind of one of the first innovative integrators of operating rooms. So we, we helped create smart ORs in the same way we have smart living rooms now. And, you know, maybe that was very specific to enabling some additional productive time for surgeons, but emotionally and practically that was very appreciated. And so having that product that A, was very, very needed by surgeons uh, and connected to their real hands-on uh, part of the episode where they're actually doing the intervention was very important. And then practically spoken, uh, we've also, besides kind of commercial uh, zero to one um, uh, relationship with new customers, we've also partnered and even acquired a small, a small startup early on with existing customer base. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff we learn in business school in terms of entrepreneurship through acquisition yeah. and the merit into organic kind of venture 
venture model that we also deployed. Uh, and again, it's a combination of tapping into like real demand that was, uh, that had low friction at the time in terms of uh, buying and uh, using existing partnerships and existing companies in the landscape to try to accelerate. It's interesting, you know, going back to what you said about the OR and the, the workflow, how the OR itself and the economics there and, the, and kind of the time management can be key to getting new technologies in. I know when, uh, you know, minimally invasive surgery started, actually one of the things that made it hard was that it, it ruined the budgets of the operating rooms. You know, they all had more supplies and things and they're like, hey, this is driving up costs. So we had to do these broader models to show like what's the overall impact on things like throughput you know, in the operating room and what the overall, you know, profit potential uh, was for the hospital in order to make that work. But it, it, it got hung up on that initially. Yeah, I mean, surgery is very multivariate, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on before, during and after surgery. So, uh, and that's kind of part of the value of care syntax, right? I mean, historically, surgery and innovation in surgery has really focused on tools and instruments for surgeons, right? We've been very clinically uh, enhancing the hands of the surgeons with new gamma knives, with the robotic systems. And I think that really helps because a surgeon surely is uh, responsible for like the, the real intense part of the intervention. But there's a whole episode. There's a preoperative preparation. There's risk gratifications and decisions are made uh, about how to conduct that procedure. There's recuperations and intensive care after that. So at the end of the day, actually, a lot of decisions throughout the entire episode, a lot of data points, a lot of workflows are being, are being activated and are in play to create that outcome. Uh, horizontal integration of all that data and digitization of these workflows was not embarked on before. Uh, and Care Syntax has built its success and its platform around being that aggregator and integrator because it's a sum of these parts enhanced that creates an improvement. So you talk about predictive analytics for surgery. What are the sort of things that, uh, that you bring to bear and how does that enhance value for the surgeon or for others? Well, if we touch on predictive analytics, um, it's really helping the surgeons, you know, do what they're already doing because every surgeon is projecting and predicting an outcome and trying to pick the right techniques and, and trying to stratify risk of each patient. The problem is, of course, especially post pandemic, just the volumes of patients, you know, we have aging population, most surgeries happen after a certain age threshold and flat graduation rate. I mean, there's not so many new surgeons coming up. You just have a lot of cognitive burden, right? So if you're trying to stratify, okay, is this a low mid or high risk patient? Very specifically to that type of procedure. Uh, that that has been historically done in, in people's heads. We are able to bring this to suggestive metrics that can allow the surgeon to weigh that with a bit of a visual cue. It's still a decision of the surgeon whether to consider that truly low risk or truly high risk, but just being able to automate some of these calculators that people have been literally doing in their head is of massive help as the volumes are rising. So that's a, it's an example. Preoperative risk stratification is one same can happen postoperatively as people leave the operating room. Is this a patient that should be discharged or is this a patient that need, needs to be kept overnight? Uh, a lot of metrics are very tailored to what happens during the procedure. And historically, a lot of players who are more enterprise wide, you know, we're talking about electronic medical records. You know, they can for sure take a stab and, and do uh, a good job in, in cohorting populations. But once it gets to the real episode and what happens within and needing to make more actionable real-time decisions, it's very hard for them. That's where we step in. Now, I understand that Care Syntax has a value proposition, not just for the surgeons, but also for those that are running the hospital or the surgery center, and then for payers as well. How, how is it that you have value to all three of those groups that are not always, they're rarely aligned? That's right. Yeah, one of, uh, uh, one of our early supporters, another former dean of our business school, Steve Wilwright, he was a, also an operations guru. Sure. He always tells us quality equals efficiency, right? I mean, nothing uh, that's not efficient uh, can be high quality, right? And so 
with respect to supporting clinical decisions, you know, part of the uh, success here is in smooth clinical operations. So for perioperative staff, automating administrative tasks, being able to, you know, help uh, match complexity with the right infrastructure, all these things uh, create uh, better outcomes. And so you could see how providing analytics that can support not only clinical tasks for surgeons, but also capacity management uh, tasks for the perioperative staff, and, you know, makes our platform very important for the operational leadership. Um, and then if you kind of roll this logic up and combine operating and clinical paradigms and put dollars on it, so make them financial, right, with access to cost data or claims data, you know, it becomes very important for the C-suite because it really translates to, uh, you know, sustainability, uh, total cost of care. Uh, and, and that's uh, actually the bridge that also brings the external partners. You know, Care Syntax works with providers, but we also work extensively with insurance companies uh, because, you know, payers, especially those who collaborate with, with providers more actively, are very interested in a mutual set of wins around total cost of care, meaning providing same or better quality at a lower cost. And so everything bubbles up from these decisions that happen at the point of care, and we're able to, you know, provide that full hierarchy. In a way, I think you've already started to answer my next question by talking about how uh, quality is defined by efficiency. But I noticed that unlike a lot of companies at your stage, Care Syntax actually operates uh, in a lot of countries around the world, whereas usually the value proposition in the U.S. healthcare system is different from what it is elsewhere. So how does it, you know, does the value proposition differ in different markets around the world? And if so, how? It's a great question, David. Um, look, I mean, let me be clear, you know, priorities may differ, but the goal of improving care for patients is universal, right? So surgeons in France and surgeons in the U.S. get into this occupation for the right reason. They want to create, to heal patients. And so there is an over, you know, there's a uniting interest in, in, in safety and in higher quality, right? Uh, divergence happens in, in, in reimbursement in models of the business models around healthcare, right? In, in the US, there's a melting pot of value-based care models, very different. There's for, like a large for-profit sector, uh, right? There's not-for-profit with its own, there's academic sector. In, in Europe, there's probably more government involvement, uh, more academic uh, segmentation. And so, uh, you know, the difference here creates, you know, slight preference for, for example, focusing on safety and clinical quality in Europe, while in the US, given presence of for-profit, there are, there's maybe more interest in throughput. You know, again, for us, as, as I said, efficiency throughput equals success and quality. So we appreciate these two uh, pillars, you know, you lean a little bit more on, on one and one continent, you lean a little bit more on the other one on the other. But everybody Got wants it. to leverage the data and everybody wants to do the right thing for the patient. So at the end of the day, whether it's the first thing we do, we all end in the same place with customers on both sides of the pond. Yeah, you mentioned there's a lot of different uh, flavors or, you know, melting pot of uh, value-based care in the U.S., and one of the things that's striking is that value-based care is it, often targeting primary care um, with a lot of metrics on what they're doing. And although primary care is certainly has responsibility for a lot of what goes on, I mean, it's a tiny portion of where the actual dollar is, but it seems like that's where a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of the focus is. Now, you've talked about the concept of a surgical ACO or accountable care uh, organization. Usually within an ACO, that they, they might have specialists included, but they usually paid fee for service, so it's not really that different. What is this concept of a surgical ACO and uh, can it work? That's a good question. I think it can work. I think it's working in, in pockets, right? At the end of the day, it's a model and, you know, I had to learn it as well as I, you know, when I came back to the U.S. from building the business in, in, in Europe, it's a, it's a mechanism for bringing together all the stakeholders to work on quality and total cost of care, right? The reason why surgery was 
you know, lagging versus primary care is because of everything we discussed, right? It's tucked away in facilities. It's very multimodal, multivariate. There's a lot of engagement with the operations of the hospitals. I think it's difficult for insurance companies or anybody in between who is, who is convening to kind of get uh, their arms around all the improve, improvement levers. Um, but you can see why Care Syntex is very confident about doing this because, you know, we have this DNA of being very close to surgeons, close to the workflows, understanding the data uh, very objectively and working with physicians. So, you know, I, I feel like we're up for the task to bring together these, you know, couple of worlds. There's a lot of interest and there's a lot more focus on specialty care and value-based care models, right? I think the bundle payment program has been a success. I mean, there's a lot that can be done to make it even sharper and, and easier for physicians to adopt, right? At the end of the day, the more data that's used from the workflow, the better the stratification of different risk cohorts we can provide, the easier is for providers to say, you know what, like I'm okay with a capitated model here because I know I can produce high quality output at the right cost. So we're all going to win here. So that transparency that we bring, which happens only if you're right there with them very granularly is the secret sauce. And so for us, uh, we're very excited about it. Obviously it's a, it's a tremendous uh, challenge to bring together these arrangements. We are still a technology company, but we are working with a lot of passionate uh, value-based organizations and even have investors who are also excited about it, like Optum and, and others. So speaking about technology, uh, one technology that's getting a lot of attention across healthcare and across you know, the entire economy at the moment is AI, and particularly generative AI. And I'm wondering how AI fits in uh, you know, to surgery and then to your world specifically. Uh, great question and extremely exciting times, right? It's all real, right? Uh, there's some hype always, but, you know, the progress is palpable, right? And so we think about it in two different ways. One very pragmatic, one tougher and strategic. The pragmatic way we use AI is, is to support, um, you know, discovery uh, and extraction of information, right? At the end of the day, a big chunk of our value proposition is to bring these disparate data feeds and make the discovery of insights from these combined data sets as easy as possible. So I always quote uh, Google, uh, you know, they invented search algorithms that make it easy to discover things also in images and videos. AI can help with that in clinical content as well. You know, we can bring, you know, surgical videos and operational data together, but you know, for busy physicians or busy administrators, how can they fast forward to the things that matter? And AI and generative AI has a lot to offer there. Um, and that's also helpful to us because it helps us make our solution more scalable. So that's kind of pragmatic short-term things. We're already doing this. Where we're getting into more and more is real strategic proprietary value in terms of supporting clinical decision-making, right? We talked about predictive analytics you know, from predictive to prescriptive, that's where AI takes place. You can push towards, you know, uh, use cases where, you know, this risk stratification becomes more and more advanced and becomes more and more real time. You know, part of our value proposition of our product portfolio is having the ability to inject AI directly into the workflow of physicians. So for example, inside the operating room, um, you know, we are able to, if that algorithm becomes mature enough, you know, to put it right there in the OR during the procedure. And so not only we're kind of developing some of those uh, that are more, I would say, generalizable across multiple procedure times, but we're also very eager to serve as a distribution channel and, uh, and a channel for best of class AI first clinical companies to really put their algorithms uh, in front of physicians. So. I think that's our role, uh, not only to develop it and inject it, but also serve as that orchestration layer into that type of intervention. And we're very excited about it. It's going to take a bit of time for the more advanced use cases, but uh, once it happens, it'll, it'll move the needle. I want to uh, congratulate you on being named to the 2024 Fierce Healthcare Fierce 15 list. Does that mean you're one of the most ferocious companies and most ferocious entrepreneurs in healthcare? 
Resilient, I would say. Resilient um, and, you know, uh, basically persistent maybe in terms of achieving things despite the, the challenges uh, that are not in our control. So we are super proud of this and it has raised visibility of Kyrcentex among thought leaders, both in the U.S. and globally. And, you know, it did kind of follow on with other recognitions like, you know, we've just... Um, spoken uh, at Times Square with, with the folks at NASDAQ, kind of from a capital markets perspective, you know, we're, we're going to be at the Milken Institute uh, conference in May. We were in Davos in January. So these things uh, we're extremely proud of uh, because that platform and that visibility allows us to, you know, to propagate the message of improving surgery. You know, you know, many folks just aren't aware of the opportunity and potential to drive outcomes um, to a next level. And, you know, all these achievements we view as a, as the next level of communication effectively. So very proud and, and thankful for the, for these awards. My final question for you, uh, Dennis, is whether you've read any good books lately, if there's anything that you would recommend or recommend that we avoid. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I wish for more time for reading, but I am actually currently rereading Ben Horowitz's uh, "Hard Thing About Hard Things." I don't know if you you've read that book uh, between yeah, the I've quotes read it. from Gangster Gangster Rep. I think there's a lot of fundamental insight about the grit and perseverance that's needed to build uh, world class businesses. You know, healthcare is an important sector. Uh, but it's not without its difficulties in terms of embedding innovation um, quickly, especially I'll make an emphasis on the word of pace, right? It's a, it's a big industry with its own set of guardrails that make innovation mission critical and hence not so fast. Um, so rereading this book, I'm getting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, mo motivation and appreciation for entrepreneurship overall. And I, I recommend that book. I think, you know, both, uh, uh, um, Mark and uh, Ben have forged an incredible journey and are very successful. You know, I think that is probably the number one most recommended book on the show. It sometimes surprises me because it's not a brand new book. Um, and it actually, you know, the lessons are drawn from sort of a relatively short time period in, in something that seems, you know, almost ancient uh, to me, but it seems to have really hit the mark with people. And it definitely, uh, you know, has some pieces for an entrepreneur. You say like, this is, you know, you look at companies and say, well, that was really successful. You, you know, you, you come from surgeons, you went to business school, you started this thing as successful. Great. You know, but there's some really uh, deep and dark and difficult moments along the way for everybody. And that book tends to resonate with entrepreneurs. It's a no BS, um, you, you know, kind of description of it, right? And it's industry agnostic, I would say. I mean, there is some, you know, lean towards enterprise B2B type uh, complexity, but still it's it's very enjoyable and a, and a must read for anybody who's trying to create change in any industry. Great. Well, Dennis Kogan, co-founder and CEO of Care Syntax, thank you for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com. Dot com.